I don't, I don't actually have um, a, a very formal presentation prepared. Um, what I'm going to try to do um, is to sketch a picture uh, of what I see as some of the important developments uh, in the energy, global energy scene uh, in the last several years and how that might uh, develop into the future and how that might affect all of us and, and then open it up for a discussion. I find that I would always learn more from the audience than, than probably the audience learns from me. So um, that's what I'm, I'm going to try to do. Um, I work in the think tank uh, in Washington, which is a nonpartisan uh, think tank, um, although uh, the American Embassy uh, helped uh, get me here uh, to, to, to Ireland. Uh, by no means do I speak for the U.S. government uh, on any of the subjects uh, that we're uh, about to venture uh, into. So. I think from the standpoint of someone who's worked in this area for, oh gee, almost 40 years, um, the first thing I would say uh, is that to remind us that we are going through um, the, uh, the highest oil prices the world has ever experienced. And uh, I hope uh, it's a little hard to, to, to look at the slide, but this is, the price of oil through the 153-year history of the modern petroleum industry in both nominal and real terms. Um, these slides are from BP. Um, and the last two years um, in 2011 and 2012 are the highest oil prices the world, average uh, prices the world had ever experienced. Uh, we forget that sometimes because we saw an even higher spike in 2008, but that just uh, lasted momentarily and then we had a collapse as a result of the worldwide economic recession preceded by the fin fin financial uh, um, uh, problems. Uh, and this year we are starting um, uh, 2013 at an even higher level than we did in 2011 and 2012. So we could have a third year of the highest um, uh, oil price the world has ever experienced. One of the things about the energy industry is that it sometimes feels like it doesn't respond to price. That is because it's a long-term energy uh, capital intensive business. There's a lag in response. Uh, most of us don't go out and buy a, a, a different car the next day after the price of petrol goes up. But we remember uh, uh, what happened to price the next time we buy a car. Same thing for um, uh, uh, housing, same thing for capital stock. Uh, there, there is a lag in demand response. There's even longer lag in supply response because it takes five, 10 years to find new resource, explore, discover, um, produce, develop new resources. So sometimes it feels like the uh, energy industry doesn't respond to price uh, very well. And, and, and that's because there is a, a lag time involved. Uh, what has happened as a result of very high oil prices is that, it, that uh, the industrialized world energy demand has, has de declined in relationship as the share of the total uh, uh, world energy demand. So we see the difference, the, the, the increases in energy consumption around the world are from the emerging economies and of course we all know about China. But this gives you a picture of what, what it looks like in 1975 more than half of the global energy demand was from the industrialized world, from OECD countries. That ratio has now flipped, and increasingly we're looking at China, but not only China, India, um, um, Middle East, and, and then the rest of the world, uh, uh, emerging economies. Um, by the way, these are Fatih Burrell's slides um, uh, uh, from the uh, World Energy Outlook that. Uh, uh, the International Energy Agency came out with um, um, uh, back in November, I guess, uh, and I understand he was here a couple of months ago. Uh, uh, he may or may not agree with my narrative using his slides, but they are his slides, so, 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 so I should credit him with that. 
Um, so th there's been a demand response uh, to high uh, oil prices and, uh, and seeing uh, the shifting of energy demand centers from the industrialized world to the emerging economies. Keep that in mind. We're going to talk a little bit, I hope, about what the geopolitical implications of that are. Um, the other thing that you would expect is um, a supply response uh, to higher prices. And what has really surprised us in the last five years is that we're that supply response was most prominent. You would never have guessed, you sh well, mo most of us were not smart enough to guess that it would come in the United States. Because after all, the United States is where the modern petroleum industry started 153 years ago in Western Pennsylvania. Western Pennsylvania should be all played out by now, right? But yet that's where the boom came, was in the United States. And this is the direction of conventional oil production in the United States um, uh, historically, but also the IEA's forecast. And here's the boom of unconventional oil that the IEA uh, reckon is going to be coming. Here's the picture on gas. For four years in a row, this will be the fifth year, the United States produced more gas than Russia. Now, if you told me that 10 years ago, I would think that you're nuts. Not, no way that can happen because you know, most of the American gas should have been produced already. Uh, uh, Russia has the big resources on the books. The, it's not possible for the United States to outproduce Russia. And because of the unconventional or shale gas or fracking revolution uh, in the United States, that's the picture that has uh, emerged instead. Now, I, I, you know, it, it's interesting to, uh, to contemplate why that is. Why did it happen in the United States and not elsewhere? Why didn't it happen in the North Sea, for example? Uh, why didn't it happen in Mexico? Uh, why did it happen in the United States? And in, in the Q&A se session, if you're interested, we, we can get into the details of it. Um, and then the other question is, you know, is that experience or the expertise, technology developed in the United States, how transferable it is to the rest of the world? Um, but what we know is that that's already had an impact on global um, uh, gas markets first because the first thing that happened was the United States is no longer importing the liquefied natural gas that we were expected to import even seven, eight years ago, and all that LNG that's produced in countries like Qatar are now available for the North Atlantic market, available for Europe uh, uh, to import. So even before uh, the question arises as to how transferable that technology is into countries like Poland in Europe, for example, you've already seen an impact um, uh, in the availability of more supply sources um, uh, than the traditional suppliers in Russia, uh, Norway, and Algeria to European markets. Um, and that has had, whether you realize it or not, an impact on European gas pricing. So one of the things that happens is the question of European gap, gas prices being linked to oil prices, that's eroding. That relationship is eroding as a result of spot gas availability in the North Atlantic market. And this is before the United States starts exporting gas. Right? You've already had this, this Im, uh, impact, and we'll talk about exports in a minute. Um, what does that mean for Middle Eastern oil? Where is it going? Where will it be going in, in, into the future? Uh, this is the picture uh, from um, no, 12, 13 years ago. The picture more or less today in 2011. Uh, and this is what the IEA says is going to happen in, in the future. The United States was, was never a big importer of, of uh, Middle Eastern oil. Uh, this is something that's not well understood, including in the United States. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is we're geographically situated to import 
uh, even though we're the largest oil importer in the world still, we're geographically situated to import it from the Western Hemisphere. So from Mexico, from Venezuela, from Canada as the largest exporter uh, to the American market of, of oil. But this is, according to the IEA, what it is going to look like in the future. What are the geopolitical implications of that? With a Europe that you know, still relies on Middle Eastern oil, Japan and Korea at a very high level, uh, United States with neg negligible imports from the Persian Gulf, and the new uh, incremental uh, consumer of Middle Eastern oil would be in countries like China and India. Contemplate that for a moment. Contemplate that for a moment in the time of uh, budget austerity around the world, including on defense budgets. Right? Uh, if you were a military planner in the United States, um, what does what are the implications of this long term? How do you plan for that future? Um, should it have should it affect you or not? There will be two schools of thought about it. One is, well, if the Europeans and the Japanese and the Chinese need that oil, let them uh, be concerned about security out of the Strait of Hormuz, not us. Right? Why should we be concerned about it? That could be one extreme school of thought uh, on it. Uh, another school of thought might be we live in an integrated world that's economically linked up in a world where you know, people wake up and are concerned about what, whether, what Spanish bond rates are going to be, that we're not going to be removed in the United States from the rest of the world. We are, uh, uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, 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 a, a superpower that has global responsibility. And if our, trading, our closest trading partners and allies are going to be affected, we're going to be affected anyway, so that responsibility doesn't change very much as a result of this. But we're talking about real life uh, uh, um, you know, uh, challenges that governments have to address. Uh, we're reducing the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean. We have been. Uh, what does that mean for the Fifth Fleet uh, in the long run? Um, who patrols the Indian Ocean, the South China Sea? Is, it some, is, is that the, uh, the, the sort of a challenge that we need to necessarily share rather than dominate with countries like India and, and China as they look at their geopolitical priorities? Uh, into the, 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 the uh, long-term future. It's the sort of thing that, that we, we don't have the answer to that, any of it, it was, but it's kind of questions that uh, come up in Washington uh, quite a bit uh, 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 recently. And all because of uh, energy. What happened to the map? That's a very abstract slide, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try that. Try this again. Yeah. Well, well, what happened to the map? Uh, okay. Something happened. Uh, Fati uh, called on his copyrights <laughs> and said, you can have all the arrows, but we're not going to tell you where, where, where they go. Uh, but imagine a, a traditional, hmm, this is the first time it's happened. Uh, imagine a traditional map of the world, Mercator projection, you know, Western Hemisphere on the left side, Europe. Uh, this is uh, global gas trade flows uh, uh, right now. Uh, the big fat uh, blue line, for example, is Russia going into Europe. Um, and, and the point, and, and I won't dwell on this since you can't see it, um, is that it's going to look a lot more complicated in the future with multiple trade flows, uh, most of that gas going into Asia, uh, but, but not uh, uh, just uh, from the traditional areas like Russia or, or North Africa into Europe, uh, but also Australia, is going, which is down here, is going to be a major supplier. There will be supplies coming out of West Africa, South America, and that light blue line is U.S. exports, the potential of U.S. gas exports, and where is it going to go? Is it going to go to Japan, which right now have even higher gas prices than Europe does, or would it come to Europe? 
Um, I, I think this is a very interesting uh, um, picture of uh, uh, different countries, or in the case of Europe, regions, uh, oil and gas import dependency. Uh, Japan is always easy to pick out. They're the most extreme example in the right upper corner because they import uh, almost 100% of both their oil and gas. And this is the direction that things are going for most of those regions. If you believe in the IEA's forecast, um, that uh, European Union will become more oil and gas import dependent, uh, moving closer to Japan's position, but not just the European Union, but also China and, and India. And the United States is going just the opposite direction. So not only will our imports um, uh, of oil be reduced, we're now the largest oil uh, 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 importer in the world by all conventional uh, projections. In about another 10 years or so, China, which have already exceeded Japan as the second largest oil importer in the world, will become the largest oil importer in the world. The United States will be importing less and will be a net exporter of gas. And what are the geopolitical implications of that, if you will? What are the um, implications of that for practical policy? Um, if the, uh, 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 the West, uh, US, and Europe no longer play uh, a large uh, function um, in um, uh, oil trade as it does today, what, what does that mean um, on practical things like, let me pick one. Iran trade sanctions. Uh, if we're no longer the incremental uh, importer, if the exports go most, mostly to uh, China, India, uh, and other emerging economies, will we have the same leverage on imposing trade sanctions on producing countries and consuming countries? Right now, we're in a, in a different position because we're a large importer. Uh, the West also controls uh, financial uh, uh, flows uh, through uh, the uh, uh, Bank of International Settlements or insurance schemes through Lloyd's and so on. Will, will the new consuming countries be satisfied with allowing uh, the West to con continue to dominate that? Are they not smart enough to figure out their own schemes on insurance? Once again, things that we don't think about, I submit, enough in places like Washington. We tend to, you know, talk to the EU, maybe, maybe sometimes, sometimes not, uh, about how to coordinate our policies, and then we roll out to the world and we tell China, Turkey, India to get on board, right? Uh, that's the MO up until now. How effective is that going to be in the future 10, 15 years down the road? We're going to have to think about that. We, you know, if we want these countries to follow or, or at least coordinate the policies with us, maybe we need to consult them first and not after the fact. So there are really important foreign policy uh, implications of, of this. Uh, and because I work in the foreign policy in, uh, institutions, those are the kind of questions that I ask. I always say in Washington, the, 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 the work of a think tank is not necessarily to have all the right answers, but at least we ought to raise the right questions so that policymakers are aware of the challenges and, and try to address them. Um, here, this is the IEA's picture on um, where the new sources of uh, energy sources uh, for power generation is going to come from. And you see, again, um, uh, the US and, and <coughs> Europe and, and, and Japan uh, really not growing very much because we are already well-developed societies and, and all the growth coming from India and, 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 and China. And in spite of the fact that the Indians and Chinese are working very hard, and, and we don't give them credit for investing as much as they actually do on renewables, uh, uh, for example, 
uh, on uh, because they have growing energy demand, uh, investing in nuclear um, uh, as well as um, changing their primary energy portfolio to go beyond oil and coal to gas, there's still going to be a significant amount of coal-fired power plant that will be built in, in both China and, and India. Um, renewable energies, a favorite subject uh, around here, I gather, in, in Ireland. Uh, but we, we know that it comes at some cost. Uh, this is the IEA's projection of what the energy subsidies to continue to uh, grow renewable portfolio is going to cost over the forecast period uh, based on existing projects as well as people's announced targets. That's for electricity, and that's the picture they painted for biofuels. Uh, at a time of you know, economic slowdown um, uh, or the big recession, uh, as, as we call it in the United States, uh, economic competitiveness, which uh, one doesn't think about as much in the time of, of prosperity and abundance, is becoming increasingly important uh, for uh, governments to consider this is the picture uh, that the IEA projects uh, uh, into the future. Um, I go to Japan regularly. They're very, very proud of having the most energy efficient economy in the world. That's because they have very high electricity prices and that comes at some cost to your economic competitiveness, something they're thinking about much more. You will see in the next several months uh, a Japanese uh, political discourse on wh whether uh, and, and how fast, how much of their nuclear power plants uh, they're going to uh, uh, reactivate. Um, and, and I think after the uh, Japanese upper house elections in June, uh, there will be an attempt by this government to restart nuclear. Uh, maybe not all the way back, but at least some of the way back, otherwise they're going to be stuck with high electricity prices for the foreseeable future. But Europe is clearly uh, similarly uh, situated in terms of high uh, electricity prices. United States, we're a little bit better off in large part because of the available gas uh, supply, um, supplementing uh, renewables. And, and China may have electricity prices that are too low for their environment to withstand because that's the environmental picture in China, right? This is Tiananmen Square last month, and I always think of that little girl in the corner, because my mental image of why the Chinese are gonna do something about the energy challenge is that that little girl has four grandparents. The four grandparents only has one grandchild, and every time that little kid coughs, there are, there are a lot of grown-ups worried about her future, uh, and, and, and why isn't the government, which is, you know, that's the forbidden city behind that you can't see, why isn't the government doing something about it? Um, for many years, I've told uh, Western um, climate negotiators that they should stop talking to China about climate. Because greenhouse gases is a problem the West created. After all, it's cumulative emissions that count. It's the 250, 300 years of industrialization in the West that led us to where we are now. If the Chinese are going to do something about their emissions, it will be for their own reasons, not for global reasons. They will be, it will be because they worry about water pollution, land use, particulates in the air. You know, it's not great when you can see the air you're about to breathe. Um, you know, uh, sulfur, sulfur dioxide, uh, uh, nitrogen oxide, the, the sort of thing that we were concerned about in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and if they, and would they do something about that, if we t talk to them about our lessons learned to remedy those traditional um, uh, environmental uh, uh, problems that we tackled decades ago, the effect of those new policy would be a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions anyway. But if you talk to them about greenhouse gas emissions, it becomes an international bargaining process. You know, 
you want us to do something, what are you going to give us in return, right? It's a negotiation. Give us technology for free. No, we don't care if it belongs to GE or some, some company. It's not the U.S. government's to give. But if you want something from us, then, then you got to give us something. But you're going to help us improve our environment. That may be a different kind of conversation altogether. So just, just some su suggestion on, on, on that score. Um, efficiency at the end of the day, efficiency improvement, is the best thing that we can all do and we all must do. This is the IEA's um, um, projection of what energy, global energy demand is going to look like out into the future um, on, on, under their base case. And this is what it would look like if we were to, the world is to adopt the kind of efficiency uh, policy improvement that they suggest. This is the reduction in coal use, oil use, gas, uh, and, 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 and so on. So we never forget that even as we are able uh, to produce more um, um, oil and gas because of the technological improvement that I mentioned, that there are still a tremendous amount of efficiency improvement uh, uh, available. The IEA tends to make its forecast, uh, because it's not supposed to be a political organization, uh, tends to make its forecast based on GDP projection and then fill in all the energy necessary uh, to, to, uh, to drive that GDP. Um, as someone who works on energy security and geopolitics of energy, I also worry about uh, the, the ability to physically move more and more oil and gas and coal around the world. Uh, the, 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 the choke points, the vulnerability in the system, even if we can geologically produce it, setting climate concerns aside for a moment, can we physically move more and more oil and gas around the world? Are there not limits to that? Uh, we're moving 80 million barrels per day, more or less, of, of oil around the world today. These projections uh, will suggest that we'll be moving 100, more than 100 million barrels per day. And can we actually do that? And every day we are reminded of the vulnerabilities, whether it is Algeria a few weeks ago, uh, what's happening in Syria, what's happening in uh, Nigeria just this week. Uh, and, and, and so efficiency improvement is still uh, the, 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 the cheapest barrel that you can uh, um, have is the barrel that you don't burn. Um, so um, that's, that, even though I'm a traditional oil and gas guy, that's something that I try not to forget in my work. And given what I've learned about the environmental consciousness of Irish people during my short trip here, I'm sure that's something that, that, that is uh, utmost in your mind as well. So with that, Eamon, Johnny, I'll, I'll close and try to respond to your uh, uh, questions uh, in a conversation. Thank, Thank you. you.